Today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer or not a follower of Christ, you get a pass, all right? This message is not for you. Now, it's, it'll be good for you to hear it because you'll get an idea of what God, according to the Scripture, expects of Christians. But if you're not a believer, you get a pass today. You've got to kind of get to listen to it and kind of, kind of you know, look, at, look at what Christianity is about. I want to start with a story. I knew a guy, uh, a guy that went to a church that everybody in the church knew. He was a very likable guy. Everybody had the same opinion of him. He was just a really casual, easygoing kind of guy. He never seemed to get ruffled, rattled by anything. Steady, casual, calm. You never knew really where he stood on any issues because it's kind of hard to be cool and take stands on issues. But other than that, he was a really cool guy. It bothered him that some of the Christians in the church had strong feelings about their convictions and their beliefs. He kind of thought they were a bit uptight, maybe a little fanatical. But he maintained his coolness, and everybody knew him. When they thought of this guy or they talked about him, they thought, yeah, he is so, he's so laid back. He made a point to actually never be passionate about anything because it's hard to be passionate about specific subjects and be cool. He was cool. However, he never really knew the joy, the fulfillment, and the purpose that Jesus described his followers should have. But he was very cool. He was very laid back, very casual. Anybody here heard of George Barna? George Barna? One person? Good. We've got one person. You want to tell us? <laughs> George Barna is a really interesting person. Let me tell you about it in a little bit. George Barna is the founder of a group called the Barna Group. If you've ever read studies on religion or Christian culture in America, you've probably read something that his group put out. It's a research firm, and they specialize in studying religious beliefs and behaviors of Americans. Mr. Barna states this. He says that at least 66% of Americans are casual Christians, which he describes as spiritually middle of the road and at times ambivalent about their faith. Mixed signals. They're not sure exactly what they believe. He states that casual Christians have faith that is moderate, allowing one to feel religious without actually doing much, without actually prioritizing their faith. Casual Christianity, he says, is often apathetic, lacking emotion, lacking passion, and indifferent. A casual Christian, he says, can be described in the scripture as lukewarm. The title of today's message is Killing the Casual Christian. We were going to call it Slaying the Slothful Servant or Drowning the Deadbeat Disciple. But we decided to, decided to go and go with Killing the Casual Christian. We thought that better describe what we were trying to say. Now, we don't want to actually kill anybody here today that would make for a very unhappy church service, wouldn't it? It would make the news. We would get some notoriety, but not for the right reason. We don't want to take anybody out today, but we do want to kill, expose, and bury an idea. We want to expose, kill, and bury a lie, and, and it's this lie, that being a Christian can mean anything you want it to mean, that I can describe whatever a Christian is, and then I can be that. And if I want to be a casual Christian, or a laid-back Christian, who's to tell me I can't? I'm deciding, aren't I? A few weeks ago from up here, we, we talked about um, America's new definition of truth, that there's no longer, according to the American definition, there's no longer any absolute truth out there. It's now relative truth, meaning that truth is whatever you want it to be. If you think it's true for you, then it's true. The problem with that thinking is Jesus. Jesus is the problem with that thinking. In John 18, 37, Jesus said, he's talking to Pilate not long before he's crucified. And he says this. He said, I came to bring truth. He actually uses the word testify. I came to testify to the truth. I came to tell the entire world what the truth really is. That's why I'm here. And that's what Jesus did. He brought the truth. Every word he said, every principle he taught, he brought truth. He defined truth. And Jesus, only Jesus, defined and described what being a disciple looks like. So what is a casual Christian, and are you one? What is a casual Christian? The word casual, casual is defined 
and the dictionary is relaxed and unconcerned. Now in America, it's a cool thing to be casual, relaxed and unconcerned. In Florida, it's really good to be relaxed and unconcerned, right? Dude, chill out. Bro. But when Jesus walked the earth, he never, ever said anything about having a casual or relaxed attitude or approach when it came to following him. In fact, he said just the opposite. Jesus used phrases like, seek me with all your heart and draw near to me and hunger and thirst for me. Hunger and thirst? That is not a casual concept, is it? Anybody ever been really hungry? Ever been really hungry? I mean, you didn't mean to get really hungry. Maybe you're on a trip or you're maybe uh, hiking, but you realize, I haven't eaten and you got starving. You thought maybe you were going to die. Anybody ever been really thirsty? I mean, beyond just I'm a little thirsty, but you got so thirsty and you had no way to get water and it actually affected your... Anybody ever been there? Not very many of us. Listen, it's a place that when you find yourself incredibly hungry or incredibly thirsty... It gets your attention. You can't think about anything else. It's an all-consuming condition to be really hungry and really thirsty, isn't it? And this is the language that Jesus used to describe what it was to follow him. Hunger and thirst. Have you found yourself hungry for God? Have you found yourself thirsting for Christ? Today, being a Christian doesn't mean what it meant when Jesus called people to follow him. And that's the point. Jesus never called anyone to be, to take on a title. Christian, I'm a Christian. Jesus called people to follow him. He said in Matthew 16, 25, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He said deny himself. It's not casual. It's not laid back. He said, take up your cross. What is that? Take up your cross. It's doing what he did. And it wasn't casual and it wasn't laid back. And then he said, follow me. Which means what? What did it mean then to follow Christ? And what does it mean today to follow Christ? Back then, it meant shaping your life around the teachings of Christ. Shaping your thoughts. Shaping your plans. Shaping your your, your dress, shaping your family, shaping everything about you to line up with the teachings of Christ. Your entire world being shaped by Jesus Christ. That's what it meant then. That's not what it means today. That today it means whatever I want it to mean. Following Christ then and that day meant two things very specifically. It meant devoting yourself to his teachings. That means following him enough to listen and learn what he taught. And going again so you could hear it again. And talking to others. What did he say? What did he say? Seeking out truth from him. Devoting yourself to his teachings. The Bible says that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to get it. They wanted to understand it. And then, this is number two, putting his teachings into practice in your life. The first one without the second one doesn't mean anything. The second one without the first one, you don't know what to apply. James 1.22, James is one of Jesus' apostles. Following Jesus, heard everything that he said. He was one of his. He loved Jesus, and he spoke for Jesus, and he wrote this. He said, be doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, thus deceiving yourselves. He's saying, when you hear it, you've got to do it. If you're hearing it, and it's making you feel better about yourself, you're deceiving yourself unless you're doing it. You ever heard a message that made you feel good about, and the message was, the information was good, you're going, man, that's really right. That's really right. I know that's right. And you walk out of church and you've not done anything to change. You just felt good about the message. You're a hearer of the word. But if you don't do anything about it, according to James, you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. If there's no change happening, no definable change, if people aren't somebody who knows you saying, what is going on with you, man? I see you changing. I mean, you're, you're just, you're working at this thing. Yeah, you still fly off every now and then, but you look like you don't like it anymore. You seem like you really want to change. What's going on with you? 
be doers of the word. See, everything that Jesus taught, every word out of his mouth, every principle that he taught was practically applicable. It was practically applicable. He didn't teach mystical ideas or ethereal concepts that were in the sky. He taught life, and Jesus taught how to live it. Dads, he taught how to be a father, how to be a, a friend. I've been married for 35 years, and my best friend is my wife, and I think that's the reason we've been married for 35 years. And I didn't learn that at home. I learned that from Jesus. I did. I learned that from God. And it's a promise for all of us. Many of us grow up not learning how to be moms or dads or husbands or wives or even good employees. I'm here to tell you, the scripture is here to tell you, that God can literally take you from where you're at and teach you how to live life in such a way that you become a blessable individual. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I came that they may have life. Talking about us. I came. This scripture is read by lots and lots of people. We like to quote this from, He came that I could have abundant life. The problem is we want it in our terms, don't we? We want abundant life. Give me that abundant life. And then we walk away and do the very things we were doing before we ever heard about Jesus or knew about him. We do the very things that break the heart of God and that Jesus teaches against. He says, don't do this. Jesus said, I came to give you life and abundantly. He didn't say, I, I came so that you could go to a church service every week and feel better about yourselves. Let me just tell you, the church services are good. I went to one one time. I didn't like it. I didn't like the music. The people weren't nice to me. There were like 700 of them. Not one of them even took the time to look around and say, hi, diddly squat. Which no one would really say diddly squat, but I was waiting for them to say anything. But four days later, I've said this story many times, a couple of teenagers came to my house and invited me back to the church for pizza and ping pong. Pizza and ping pong. And I went. And I found Christ. And it changed, it changed everything. And the church service mattered to me after that. The worship mattered to me. But what really mattered was that I'd come to know Jesus Christ personally. My relationship with God started before I ever went to church or in the church service. Listen, put this on your fridge. Write this down. Remember it. It's life that Jesus brought, and it's truth that Jesus taught. Life and truth. Truth and life. When you're living your life without truth, you're not living. He came to bring life, and he brings it through truth. At that time, applying the teachings of Jesus to your life meant that you were going to live your life against the grain. Did you know that? If you're going to live your life for Christ, follow the teachings of Christ in that day, you're going to be living your life against the grain. You were literally going to be swimming upstream against the current of that culture. Because everything that Jesus taught about life was against the cultural current at that time. Guess what? We're there again. That's exactly what following Jesus means today. Living your life against the cultural current. Living your life against the cultural current. But you can't do that. If you're so wrapped up in this world's beliefs, in this world's concept, this world's behavior, this world's attitudes, that you have no room for actually living for Jesus, applying the truth that he puts out there for us to apply. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. Those ideas are diametrically opposed to the world that we live in today. In the third chapter of Revelation, God speaks to a church through the apostle John. Listen to what he says to a church in a place called Laodicea. Revelation 3.15 says this. Now he's talking to these people very personally. He gets real personal, gets in their face. He says, I know your deeds. Stop there for a second. I know your deeds. I know what you do. I know how you treat each other. I know how you spend your time. I know what you think about. I know your deeds. I know what you do or do not do for each other. I know your deeds that you were neither hot nor cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, when I was a kid, I read this. I was 16 years old. I was a new Christian, and I thought I understood this. 
I thought would have meant that God wanted us to be either cold or hot. Cold meaning you don't know Christ, you don't, you don't, you, you've never made a commitment to him, maybe someday you will, but that's cold. And hot is, you know, you're on fire for the Lord, we called it. You're, you're tuned up for God, you're going to live for God, and God would rather us be cold or hot, but don't be in between, don't be a Christian in that, but that's, you know what, I was wrong. Not studying the scripture, not knowing exactly what that word meant, led me to a wrong conclusion. Here's what it actually means. Hot or cold is referring to water. We'll see that in just a minute. It's a reference to water. And he's saying, I wish you were either cold or hot. Cold water has a purpose in that culture. If you were parched and thirsty, cold water refreshed you. Nothing like a drink of cold water to bring life back into you. Hot water had a purpose. You could boil hot water. You could cook with it. You could clean with it. You could disinfect with it. Hot water had a purpose. But lukewarm water in that culture, when you're talking about lukewarm, it was like, it's of no value. Now, in that context, he says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, he says, neither hot or cold, not good for anything, useless for my purposes, not doing anything for anybody else, you're neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And the literal translation of that word spit is vomit. This is a word that they took out of the text. It's not a pleasant word. But think about it. When you get sick enough to throw up, it's because you're sick. It's because your body's rejecting something. Something's going on in you that's not healthy. And God is literally saying to you, when you live your life in such a way that does nothing for anyone else, you serve nobody else's purposes, you are living for yourself, you're just staying alive. You're just keeping your head above water. It takes all I can do just to keep my head above water. And I understand. Listen, if you're living for you and you alone, that is exactly what you're trying to do is keep your head above water. I heard Rick Warren one time say, and I really like Rick Warren. I think he's a good teacher. I've learned really a lot from him. And he said this. He said, when you're living your life for God's purposes and you're helping other people, and you're, you're spending your life on others. Did you know that you obligate, you obligate God to take care of you? You obligate God that his promises become true for you? God says, I'll supply your needs according to my riches and glory. Because you are serving my purposes. And I'm not going to leave you alone. You're not going to be hungry or go without. When we're serving our own purposes, when we're lukewarm, good for nobody else. It's no wonder we struggle. It's no wonder we're just trying to keep our heads above water. Find somebody to go serve in the name of Jesus. Find somebody to go feed in the name of Jesus. Find something to do that's not for you. I know if you have kids, you serve them. We should be serving them. If you have a spouse, a dear friend, you should be serving them. But I'm talking about somebody you don't know. Somebody that in the name of Jesus you can go to and you can serve. You can share truth with people who don't know Christ. Man, I can tell you stories. Somehow all these stories have been coming to me recently. People come and tell me what's going on. Last night, my daughter Allie was playing guitar. She goes, sits on Osceola Street and plays guitar, and people throw money in her guitar case. We won't give her any money, so other people give her money. It's amazing. No, she's awesome. And she said an elderly man came by, and she said, Dad, he was like in his 70s, and he just stood and listened for a minute. And she said, so I, I, I tried to sing a couple of songs I thought he would know. So she sang the, she sang the old spiritual song, Ain't no sunshine when she gone. Remember that song? It's a spiritual song. No, it's not. Well, anyway, she sang that song. And he heard the song, and he like, oh, he, he seemed to like it. Then she started singing the Alleluia song, you know. Alleluia, Alleluia. She's singing it. And she said he just started sobbing. She said, Dad, he was sobbing. And she goes, it broke my heart. And, and finally, she said, I just have to stop. And I said, are you okay? And, and he said, well, no, honey. He said, my wife, you know, I, we were married 45 years, and she passed away recently. And, and these are all songs that we remember when we were younger and, and back in the 70s. And, and how I said, I'm remembering it. And she just it said, Dad, I bro it broke my heart. I stood up and said, can I hug you? And he, he looked a little taken back. He said, yes. And she said, I hugged him, and I invited him to church. He said, you know, I go to a church. He goes, well, I already go to a church. He goes, I don't really know anybody. And she goes, no, but I want to invite you to a community, to a place where people will love you and surround you and, and bless you. 
Yeah. Last week I heard about somebody else that I know very dearly that said he went to answer a, a Craigslist ad and that when he walked into the door, he, it was a very nice house and the man was packing to go. And, um, and he got in a conversation with him and the man just kind of opened up and shared his story. And he was leaving town because less than a month earlier, his son, his 17-year-old son had died. And his son was, was, um, uh, had dwarfism. He was a little person. And all the, all the issues that go, medical issues that go with a person who has dwarfism. And they were going to do an operation that was a simple thing. And they had done this before. It was not going to be a big deal. And something happened on the table and he passed away. And this man said, and he's telling this young man this. He said, you know this, my son was my life. We couldn't have any more kids. They told us they would all have the same thing. And we, we didn't want to bring a suffering child in. So we had this one boy and we focused our whole life on him. And we're just broken. And this person, you know, can I pray for you? Prayed for them. Invited them to church because this is where we know we found life and a lot of folks find life in a church. Are you living your life just for yourself? I believe if you ask God to give you some divine appointments, I believe if you go out looking for people who are hurting, ready, being near to God, God will use you. He'll put you in a place and in a moment where you can be an angel, I believe, speak for him and actually help somebody. People are in this building today. A lot of people are in this building today because somebody cared enough to invite them to a place where they thought life, could, life change could happen. So often we float through life just trying to keep our heads above water. You want to know the antidote? Get out of yourself. Push yourself out of your comfort zone. Take some risks. He goes on to say, listen, he's talking to a church that felt really good about themselves, right? It must have had a pretty good congregation going on, probably some really good speakers, things were good. He says, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What a statement to say to a thriving church. You are wretched. You are pitiful. You are poor, blind, and naked. He's saying, spiritually speaking, you got nothing going on. You're just doing church. And he says in verse 20, I love what he says here. You notice he didn't say, I have vomited you. I will vomit. He says, he, he didn't say, I have already vomited you. You make me sick. I'm done with you. He said, I am about to. I'm warning you. Then he goes on in verse 20. And he says, here I am. Here I am. I've not gone anywhere. I'm still here. He says next, I stand at the door and knock. He says, I am knocking on your door here. I'm trying to get your attention here. I don't want to vomit you out of my mouth. I don't want you to make me sick. I want you to get your ducks in a row and begin to live your life for the reason I created you. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. He goes on to say, if anybody will listen and open that door, I will come in. I'll have a meal with them. I'll fellowship with them. So what do we do? What do we do not to be a casual Christian? I'm going to tell you, listen, it is like default mode. Default mode for us just to kind of float through. That's what we do. When we're not intentionally doing a thing, we tend to float through. We have to intentionally, as individuals, seek God first so he can enable us, teach us how to be functional, healthy, helpful people. What do you do not to be a casual Christian? How can we not be lukewarm? How can we be hot or cold? In the next few weeks, Nate and I are going to be teaching messages on this. Pay attention. Listen closely. Desire deeply not to be lukewarm, not to let any area of your life be lukewarm. But here's a place to start today. In the book of James, again, James who walked with Jesus, he says this, James 4, 8, he says, listen, here's what you do. Starting now, draw near to God. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Now, right, listen, he didn't put a qualifier on that, did he? Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you today or immediately. You draw near to God, and you stay there. Because he will draw near to you. You draw near to God. Yeah, but what if in three days he doesn't? What if in a way you draw near to God, and you continue to draw near to God? Because at some point, he will draw near to you. It's a promise he makes. He will draw near to you. 
Listen to what he says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands. Wash your hands of the stuff that you've been doing that just separates you from God. Wash your hands of the stuff that you see and hear that is, has nothing to do with God or Christ or Jesus or love or joy or peace or purity. Wash your hands of the sinful habits that separate you from God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If there's a phrase that describes church people today, it's double-minded. We're focused on church on Sundays, and then we compartmentalize that. Our lives are a pie, and we give God a slice. And if we're really spiritual, we give them the Wednesday night slice. Be single-minded. Colossians, Paul writes to the church at Colossae and says, If then you've been raised with Christ, if you are a follower, if you identify with Jesus, seek, think, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not things on the earth. He's not saying set your mind on heaven there. He's saying set your mind on all the things that Jesus taught that are pure things, godly things, kingdom of God things, heavenly things. Set your mind on these things. And then in Philippians 4, Philippians 4, 8, we've probably read this for five times in the last couple of months because we want to get it. We want to get it. Paul writes and he says to, to the church, and he says, finally, I'm going to sum it all up. You ready? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Focus on these things. Dwell on these things. Live these things. Take, take every TV show you watch. Talking to all of us here. Every book you read. Everything you subject your eyes and your ears to and you weigh it under that. Is it honorable? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it commendable? Is it excellent? Is it worthy of praise? It is no wonder we walk in confusion and double-minded because we take this scripture and we just ignore it because I like that. Can we pray today? Can I lead you in a prayer? Would you join me? Let me pray for you. God, I just pray that you would enable us to follow you. Simply to follow you. To follow you by taking the teachings that are, that are alive today, that are right before us in your word. Your teachings that men and women all over the country and all over the world are preaching because they're true. That you would allow us to take these truths and apply them to our lives and not settle for less. And if we've been lived an entire life without truth and without you, that we start now to seek you and to apply these things, to stop measuring our life by a standard that has nothing to do with truth or God, that we weigh our lives and measure our lives by truth. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would move in the hearts of everybody here, that we would decide I'm not going to live for my own purposes anymore. I'm going to find the truth that Jesus taught. I'm going to line my life up with it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to find a way to go out and walk and become a friend of God. God, I pray today that you would hear our, our prayers and hear our cries. That you would raise up in this building a godly people that live with humility and integrity. possible, that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I pray this in Jesus' incredible, awesome name.